Hello there. Welcome to my show. COVID-19 update by Hirak. Uh, for October 18, 2020. And today is the Lord's Day, otherwise known as Sunday. And we call Sunday's Lord's Day because it's the first day of the week. And it is the first day of the week when Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Uh, and so Christians have Christian Sabbath on uh, Sunday. And that's why church is made on Sundays to worship. So the tradition goes back like 2,000 years. Um, yeah, today is National Chocolate Cupcake Day, uh, October 18th. Yes, there's a National Chocolate Cupcake Day. Neela uh, Whitaker, who's a member of our Clinical Nurse Leader 2020 at Georgetown University, uh, she's working as an ICU nurse uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, she's amazing at making food. I've tried her cookies. I've tried her cakes. Oh, my gosh. She should open, like, a business, like Neela's or Whittico's. I don't know. Whittico sounds better, don't you think? Like, you know, Whitt Whittico's sweets or something like that, you know? Um, I bet it will sell out. She'll probably become a multimillionaire just by selling her food, <laughs> you know? Oh, her food is so good, you know. Um, and um, yeah, so you know, I wish the best uh, to Neela, uh, you know, uh, in her new uh, RN residency uh, program in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, there are several of us in our clinical nurse leader program who are in RN residency programs now. Um, uh, as I mentioned a few days ago, Billy, one of our clinical nurse leader uh, 2020 program members at Georgetown. He took his uh, NCLEX RN exam, like, uh, I guess it was on Thursday. Uh, so he'll probably hear back about the result on Monday. I'm sure he passed. He's, he's a brilliant guy. Went to U.S. Naval Academy and then served the U.S. Navy for like 20 years as an officer. They still like part of it, but uh, he went to like a nursing school. Um, he entered, he was actually originally a CNL 2020 um, uh, or CNL 2019, uh, made in La, Megan La Savage's uh, uh, cohort. She was the president in her cohort. Uh, and Meredith uh, Goodrich is uh, uh, president of our cohort, uh, CNL 2020. But uh, Billy went and served in a, a secret mission for US Navy. Uh, um, I, he does like the intelligence work uh, for the US Navy. So uh, he was there, you know, fighting the Islamic terrorists for, uh, I guess, one year. Uh, so they took him out of the program for one year and then brought him back. <laughs> so he, uh, he, he graduated with, uh, you know, uh, my cohort, CNL 2020. Uh, and he was the group leader for my uh, final uh, uh, capstone project. There were like uh, several of us uh, in our group and he was our group leader. And uh, our capstone project was improving the RN residency program uh, at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. So uh, we worked with uh, Chief Nursing Officer CNO uh, at MedStar Georgetown Hospital. And I guess it was a Chief uh, Research Officer, I guess that's her official title, uh, at MedStar Georgetown Hospital. Because, you know, like nurses engage in research. Uh, and um, in September of 2021, all of us, uh, you know, in um, RN residency program at Virginia Hospital Center, uh, we are to submit a poster research. Uh, and then uh, we have our graduation ceremony for our RN residency program. I already got the frame for it, you know? So when I get the, I guess, I hope they give us like a really cool certificate that we could put it on a frame, you know? <laughs> but so, uh, no, I gotta, I, you know, I mean, yeah. I didn't get it specifically for that, to be totally honest. There was like a three for one special on Amazon. Um, so I got, you know, three different frames I could use, you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, I got one of the frames to frame my um, Virginia RN uh, license, which is pretty big. It's not like eight by 11 and a half, like uh, Washington DC's uh, RN license. It's like eight and, I guess it's eight by 10. So you could put in a frame for like eight and a half by 11 uh, frames. But uh, Virginia's RN license is like much bigger in size. 
So I had to get a new frame. And I guess, you know, since I was getting a new frame, I was just kind of looking through the deals at Amazon.com. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I found one that has like three different frames just for like a fairly good price. So, uh, um, so I got that, you know, so uh, I think I'll get a lot of different, <laughs> you know, certificates and stuff in the future that whole frame. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's always uh, cheaper to buy in bulk. That's why they go to Costco, right? That's why you go to Costco or, you know, uh, to buy in bulk. This is always cheaper. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, one of the frames is going to my RN, RN license from Virginia, multi-state that covers like 30 states. And uh, I guess I could hold on to one of the frames for, uh, you know, uh, our quote graduation ceremony uh, for um, our RN residency program at Virginia Hospital Center. So, you know, I'm going to be researching on my unit specific issues, how to improve our, our patient center care. Uh, you know, how, how can we make our um, work in our unit efficient? Uh, and also, you know, we, we are a uh, uh, magnet hospital, Virginia Hospital Center. That means that we are recognized for our nursing excellence. Uh, you know, a Fairfax hospital used to be a magnet hospital, but they lost their magnet status. So uh, that's why, I, I, to be honest with you, that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to go to Innova Fairfax. I'm like, I don't want to work in a non-magnet hospital if I can help it, you know? So, you know, when I found out, you know, and I found out during uh, my uh, nursing uh, clinicals at Innova Fairfax Hospital um, in the cardiac uh, step-down unit, and I found out from the nurses in the unit, you know, uh, that they lost the uh, magnet nursing status, you know, and for a nurse working at a magnet hospital is like a big honor and all the great nurses try to work at a magnet hospital, you know, uh, so that I, you know, I'm a great nurse. So it stands to reason I'd want to work in a hospital that is recognized for its nursing excellence, right? I mean, when I do my... Um, uh, nursing research and submit my post for research at Virginia Hospital Center, along with my uh, RN residency core members. All of us are trying to improve Virginia Hospital Center, right? That's why we're doing this research for one year. Uh, and I want to improve my unit, obviously, to be efficient, better. Uh, so I will research the most latest uh, nursing uh, research, uh, evidence-based research, we call it, ERD. Um, or EBR, uh, and then present it, and I'll probably present that at a academic conference, uh, you know, um, uh, a nursing conference, maybe at, uh, you know, uh, Sigma, which is a nursing honor society conference, or uh, at, um, you know, American Nurses Association conference, and there are different types of nurses conference in America, uh, but there's also nursing conferences around the world. So, you know, I mean, I like presenting stuff around the world, that gives me an excuse to travel and see things. Um, we don't know what the situation will be next year, like September-ish, uh, when uh, we submit our uh, evidence-based research. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, <laughs> you know, if things are not bad. I'd love to go to like Paris or Warsaw, Poland, you know, or somewhere, you know, or, or you know, better yet, maybe like Palma de Mallorca or Barcelona, Barcelona, you know, in Spain. So, um, yeah, and then you could hang out in the beach for a while too, you know, because uh, part of the Maloka beaches are great. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at topics now to uh, research for one year or an evidence-based research for uh, um, my hospital, Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, and, um, you know, there's like, you know, I guess there's like 17 of us who are RN residents. It's I think we may be the biggest RN residency class. I don't know. Um, because I think typically they're much smaller, but, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe I drew the crowds, you know, who knows, but, uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, Virginia Hospital Center is getting really popular with nursing graduates, which is great to see. Um, yeah, last night from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., um, I worked at uh, Virginia Hospital Center, uh, and there was the other, other resident working there. Uh, from George Washington Hospital. She's great, you know, it's always fun to work with her. And uh, yeah, she's uh, she's in a different cohort uh, from my cohort. She's in an earlier cohort. Uh, so in a year, you know, they have several cohorts. 
our, you know, the next cohort is going to be the January 2021 cohort. Uh, so you're gonna, if, you, if you're graduating from nursing school or if you graduated like in the summer, like in August, like my fellow cohort members, clinical nurse leader cohort members, CNL 2020, apply to Virginia Hospital Center. You guys will love it, you know, and you can start, you know, uh, in January. Because I think most cohorts are starting in January anyway. Uh, because, you know, like, I think, I think like, uh, you know, I, I know Georgetown MedStar Hospital only has two cohorts, which is July and January. Uh, some hospitals has more, have more than two cohorts, but, you know, uh, yeah. So, uh, but you will love the cohort system at Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's very supportive and, uh, uh, you know, um, yeah, I think you you uh, you you really love Debbie, who's the in charge of the core programs. Um, yeah, she's really nice. And um, yeah, so anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, I was thinking about you know, I mean, thinking about school and classes. You know, in a sense, you know, RN residency is like a one year long program, uh, and um, you know, hopefully they give us a really nice cool like diploma or something that we can hang up. Uh, but um, yeah, so um, anyway, uh, you know, uh, then uh, I guess, uh, you know, one year from now, I go from uh, clinical nur nurse one to clinical nurse two, which is equivalent in other hospitals to RN nurse one to RN nurse two. Uh, so I think at Virginia Hospital Center, the highest you go is RN nurse four. So you have RN nurse one, two, three, four. Um, yeah, and then, you, you know, uh, at every stage, you're gonna jump like hoops and do stuff to get get up to a higher level. Um, but yeah, so uh, so it's gonna be you know it's it's gonna be a fun year. You know, I like my my uh, RN resident nurse nurse uh, colleagues. You know, they they all like graduate from nursing school. Uh, you know, uh, within you know with, within less than a year. That's I think that's the requirement. You have to. You have to graduate from a, a nursing school in less than a year to be in this RN residency program. For some graduated, you know, I mean, I, you know, I graduated in August 24, 2020, technically. Um, but you know, um, we have a lot of people in my core who graduated in May 2020, because most nursing students they don't take their NCLEX RN uh, exam that makes you an RN nurse to receive a license right away they study like two three months sometimes more than that so we have a lot of uh, nursing uh, graduates nursing school graduates graduated in like may and then they you know they study for the rn nursing exam like in you know may june july uh and you know and then they took it in august you know so they study like three months and took it in august you know there are people in my cohort who, uh, you know, we graduated in August 24. Technically, I'm although our, our classes were over on on um, August like 6, 2020, but you know, the, the several weeks until our graduation like day. But most of my, uh, I think majority of the clinical nurse leader uh, graduates are, uh, haven't taken their NCLEX RN yet. I think there are even some who are, you know, start, uh, planning to take it like three months later, so it's September, uh october november like some of them are planning to take the exam in november or even december to make sure that they pass and then they would start working in january with their uh, you know pass exam and their actual license so um so i mean there are there are a few who are planning to take you know like planning to take it later and uh, there's a study really hard to make sure they pass um yeah because it stays with you right i think it stays with you if you don't pass because uh, the test score goes to your board of nursing. And then uh, you'll be like Peg as the person who didn't pass the first time, you know? Um, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, if you get a license, you get a license. Is that kind of like selling your driver's license test, you know? It could be embarrassing, but I mean, if you have a license, you have a license, right? But I don't know if it will hurt you if you want to apply for other programs in the future. Like, you know, if you want to become a family nurse practitioner or, um, you know, nurse nurse an an ethicist or uh, um, and, you know, or uh, do a PhD or a doctoral nursing practice, like a doctorate in nursing. I don't know if it hurts you or not. Um, you know, I guess it, it could be different from school to school and from state to state. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously it's always better just to pass the first time. 
And the worst part is actually your school gets the results. So let's say, you know, a uh, student A takes uh, and collects an iron and fails, but then your school finds out. And enough of you fail, your school can lose the accreditation. Like, you know, like, I think George Mason University lost their accreditation as a nursing school, I think for a year or something. Somebody was telling me, I, you know, don't quote me on it, but George Mason University is in Fairfax County. And, you know, I thought it was one of the best nursing schools in the in the state, but I guess not. And because they, uh, they lost their accreditation for nursing for like a year. I think they said for a year. And like if enough students fail their NCLEX RN exam, you can lose your accreditation. Um, so, um, you know, so obviously directors of nursing programs want you to pass the first time. So let, let's say for example, like a student A from Georgetown University takes NCLEX RN and fails the first time takes it again and fails again the second time, takes it again and, and then passes the third time. The student herself is a nurse now after the third time, maybe one year went by. Uh, she was unemployed for one year, but she, you know, she finally eventually passed. Uh, but so, you know, she might've gone through humiliation from her coworkers, her family, uh, you know, because everybody's probably like, you know, what you, you, know, you can't really lie about it, right? If you fail your NCLEX RN and you're not working as a nurse, I mean, people know about it. Like everybody, you know, that you're close to will know about it probably, right? Professionally, maybe a lot of people will know about it. So uh, it could be embarrassing, but at least like a year later, you're working as a nurse. You might have like $50,000 in credit card debt or something, but uh, because you're unemployed, you know, uh, for one year. Uh, you know, before uh, starting as an RN nurse. But, um, so you pass that you're an RN nurse, but the nursing school that you went to suffers because the way it works in nursing school accreditation is they don't care whether you pass or not on the second or third try. If you fail on the first try, then your school could lose accreditation. So from the school's vantage point, the most important thing is that you pass your NCLEX RN the first time. So for example, let's say uh, at um, Georgetown University uh, Clinical Nurse Leader Program, we have 25 people graduated in August 24, 2020 in our cohort, 2020 CNL cohort. Uh, so let's say um, five people flunk uh, NCLEX RN because they're like all eager to take it. So as soon as, uh, you know, um, their authorization test came out. They're like kind of thinking like, I'm just gonna take it in advance. You know, you know how some people are, they, they lose sense of reality during COVID-19 era. You know, <laughs> you know how that is? You probably know a buddy who just doesn't quite understand the sense of reality because like COVID-19 has kind of dis disoriented her. You know what I'm saying? So like you get your authorization to test and you're like, yes, I'm just gonna go and take it. And let's say there are like five people who did that without really studying properly. You know, maybe they took several sample exams, but they didn't really study it. Because you're gonna study all the subjects over again, right? Every single one, right? If you really wanna pass, you gotta know every single area really well. Um, that's why, you know, the previous core, core 2019, they pay like $800 to do a, what is it? Like a 16 week of Kaplan class. That's like over hundred hours of classes. Right, so that they could pass, and that's why they passed. But uh, you know, Kaplan uh, and Klesar and exam courses were all closed because you know, uh, from what I understand, it was closed. I don't know, maybe they had an online version. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, uh, so let's say you know there were five of us in our Georgetown University uh, clinical nurse leader program who got their authorization to test, and they're like, oh, you know, I'm just gonna take it. You know, I'm sure I'll pass. You know, I got a 3.5 from. Georgetown, uh, how can I fail? You know, maybe let, let's say they think like that and they go and they took it and they flunked, like five of them. So that's like 20% of the students flunked. Uh, I don't know how what the percentage is, like percentage of your cohort flunking will result in Georgetown losing their accreditation as a nursing school, for example. I don't know what the, the statistics are. I'm sure our director, CNL 2020 uh, director, uh, Idioma Yearwood, I'm sure she knows all the stats because she knows she's the director. But um, but I, there is a certain cutoff point, like 
X number of people have to pass to maintain your your uh, nursing school accreditation. That's why I told Mason University, which is a good nursing university uh, from what I understand, but they lost their accreditation because enough of their students flunked uh, and collects around exam. So it does happen. Um, and I've known other nursing schools where it happened to. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen to Georgetown uh, University of Nursing School. Obviously that could be really embarrassing for Georgetown University, you know? I mean, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, but I mean, I'm hoping everybody passes, you know? I hope that, uh, you know, I'm sure Billy passed, you know? We'll find out on Monday. Uh, so uh, there are three guys in my clinical nurse leader cohort. Uh, that's um, uh, Billy, Grant, and me. So we were three guys, everyone else is women. 22 are women, three are guys. And Billy is African-American from Texas. And he has like Texas flag in his room because we did Zoom classes, right? So we'll see his face and then Texas flag behind them. Uh, these Texans love their flag, you know, they're, uh, they're stay. <laughs> I, I, I don't own a Pennsylvania flag or, or Virginia flag, you know, because I, you know, I went to school, high school, middle school, elementary high school, middle school, but you mentioned middle school, high school, college in Pennsylvania. I don't own a Pennsylvania flag. I don't own a Virginia flag. And I'm running for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th district, Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church of Fairfax County as an independent candidate, as you know. So vote for me in absentee ballot uh, on early voting and in uh, on November 3rd. Uh, if you want me to go to U.S. Congress to represent you, obviously you put me in Congress if you want to. If you don't want to put me in Congress, don't put me in Congress, right? It's your choice. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, you, know, you know, Billy has this big Texan flag. I mean, geez, it's like the biggest flag I've seen in somebody's room, <laughs> you know, but you see it on Zoom, right? Uh, and Grant is from North Carolina, uh, and he and his girlfriend are settling down in South Carolina. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe I've never seen Grant with like a North Carolina flag. Actually, I've never seen anybody with a North Carolina flag. Do North Carolinas like are they proud of their state and do they have their flag? I don't know, I've never seen that. But I've seen lot, lots of that with Texans. Yeah, they're really proud of this thing. Uh, Grant is white, like Anglo-American as you can get. Uh, and his, his girlfriend is really pretty, you know. Uh, he seems a lucky man. She's an interior decorator. Uh, so he, he lucked out in the girl department. Uh, and then there's me who's Asian. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, this is the three guys who represent three th different races, white, black, and Asian. <laughs> you know, at Georgetown in my core, which is kind of funny. But uh, yeah, I mean, all of us are, you know, we get along, you know. Um, you know, getting along among guys isn't that complicated. There are basically three rules you follow and you get along among guys. We're not complicated like women. And, you know, women are very complicated, you know, and men don't understand women really because women are so complicated. But men are simple. And Generally, if you follow three rules in any city setting, guys will get along. Yeah, I mean, there, there isn't going to be a conflict if you just follow three, three rules. Rule number one is do not touch any man's woman. And that's like rule number one. Like the moment a guy is dating a woman, she's off limits. You know, I mean, like, that, that's rule number one. That, that is the most important rule for guys. Like if a guy makes a claim to a woman, I mean, it sounds bad, but I'm talking about the male world here, right? And it's, male world is male world, whether it's Europe, America, Korea, China. Um, you know, if a guy makes a claim to a woman, um, you don't move in on his territory. And that, you know, and, Something that w women don't understand is that goes for relationships. And to a lesser extent, even if there isn't a relationship, a guy can make a claim, like explicitly among the guys. Then there's a tacit rule. You don't make a play for that girl unless you wanna have a problem, you know? So, um, you know, that is a lesser rule, but the major rule is like if a guy is married or has a girlfriend or has a fiance, it doesn't matter, you know, whichever level, uh, of uh, of uh, of being a boyfriend and girlfriend, you just do not touch that woman. You know, I mean, 
Um, you don't know how the guy will respond. The guy's response to touching her, his woman can be varied, right? Depending on the guy. Some guy will shoot and kill you. Some guy will stab you and kill you. Some guy will punch you to death. Probably the most painful way to die. You know, but, you know, um, there are guys who will do that. I mean, you know, when you move in a, on a girl who put, belongs to another guy, most guys would not say that's unfair. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like if somebody kills a guy who sleeps with another guy, girlfriend, most guys would say it's fair if he gets killed by the guy who, uh, who, uh, who, whose girlfriend uh, was, was, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, that's just, most guys think that's fair. Um, but, um, you know, so, so that's rule number one. So the moment that a guy says, you know, she's my girlfriend, like the absolute rule is you don't move in on her, never. Uh, and that kind of applies as a corollary too. If a girl says, I have a boyfriend and you may know her, her boyfriend or you may not know her boyfriend, but if you move in on her, then you have to be ready for the fight with this guy that you may not know. And that's the corollary to, uh, to the rule number one, meaning like you don't know this guy, but if a girl says she has a boyfriend, then this unknown boyfriend ex can retaliate against you, right? That, that's an unspoken rule that is attached to rule number one. So if you're willing to have that happen to you, then you move in. But it's like suicide mission, you know what I'm saying? Uh, because you don't know the guy, you don't know how he is. He could be like an ex-convict with like 30 different guns, you know? You don't know who he is. Uh, so it's worse, at least if you know the guy and he has a girlfriend, you can size him up. Like, oh yeah, he's a peacenik, like a Hebrew, uh, you know, for like somebody who loves peace. He's never gonna kill me with a gun or a knife because he's a peacenik. Although, you know, peacenik can go dejonte, as French people say, is crazy and kill you because of his jealousy about his girlfriend. That does happen. Jealousy, you know, crimes of passion, but they call it in law to happen. Actually, you can get, get off scot free, you know, if you're a guy who kills somebody because he just found out that uh, you slept with his girlfriend, you could actually walk, you know, you may not even do any jail time, you know, yeah, it's called crime of passion, especially like in like France, you know, or parts of America where love matters, you know, romantic love is like really important, you know, um, yeah, you can walk, or if the judge is, you know, judge or jury, they're kind of into romance, you know, like into sappy kind of Cary Grant kind of movies or Sleepless in Seattle kind of movies, you know? Um, but anyway, um, yeah. Um, although ironically, Sleepless in Seattle and uh, uh, Cary Grant movie on a fair to remember, they're both like movies about a guy making a play for a girl who's supposedly taken. But you know, that's why it's fiction. Right? It's not real reality. In real life, people, men don't behave in a peaceful way <laughs> when it comes to their women. Men will do whatever they can to protect their their uh, asset, you know, and their most prized asset is always a woman. Right? They're willing to throw everything away for a woman. Yeah, on principle. So even if the guy is not madly in love with a woman, he will go out of his way to destroy you just because, you know, it's the rule. You know, it's the rule number one for men. You never move in on a territory, you know, uh, another man's uh, territory that way, uh, unless you want a war. So, um, yeah, so it's not about what, how much love he is in. That's not the issue here. Uh, it's about man's respect for himself, man's respect among men, right? Uh, because all men expect retaliation. So if you don't retaliate, you lose the respect of the men. You know, it, it's a crazy world, men's world, uh, but it's a simple world. As long as you do not screw any other man's girl, you should not have to worry about uh, inviting violence from, you know, normal men. You know, I mean, you could live, live peacefully among men as long as you don't move in on other men's territory. Um, yeah, so that, that's rule number one. Uh, rule number two is um, 
you know, don't talk about personal stuff. Just like keep it simple, you know, watch football games together, play soccer together. Don't try to like talk about stuff. Guys hate that. Guys hate it when some idiot guy tries to like pour out his art. I mean, just suck it up and take it, you know? It's like, yeah, your wife died and yeah, we feel for you. Yeah, but don't go and talk and talk and talk, you know? I mean, geez, for God's sake, your wife died. Yeah, we, we, we feel it. We just don't want you to talk about it, you know? I mean, if you want us to go to a football game with you, we'll go and we'll, we'll go to a football game with you. If, we want to, if you want us to watch like uh, 10 hours of basketball reruns, the Lakers reruns, we will do that with you. If you want to go and like just hit the town and just have fun, you know, yeah, we'll do that with you. You know, and for some guys, you know, uh, if you want like us to drink with you until you're like in a stupor, we'll do that with you. But just don't talk about your wife, you know? <laughs> and that's like rule number two, just keep your mouth shut then you will survive in the man's world. You know, just don't talk about anything. I mean, seriously, don't talk about anything, then you survive in the man's world. The more you talk in the man's world, the more chance you're gonna alienate other men. Like, like, you know, men do not bond by talking to each other. That's not how men bond. We're not women, you know, we, we do not bond by talking to each other. Uh, in fact, you can make a lot of enemies by talking too, too much. Because men just don't like it when other men talk. We just, we don't like it when women talk, but men want to have sex with women, so they just pretend like they, they're listening. But when other men talk, men are like, geez, man, it's like, I don't have to put up with this. You know, I mean, geez. You know, you know so that's how guys are, you know. Um, so... You know, if you're like a high school graduate guy wanting to survive in the man's world, this is the best advice anybody can give you. Do not move in on another man's woman and do not talk too much in the man's world. Do not share your feelings. If you want to share your feelings with another male, do it with your father. You know, I mean, your father will probably put up with it, but don't do it with any other male. You know, um, yeah, because that's, we don't live in the movies. In the movies, like two best friends, like talk about things for hours. In the real world, it's not like that. Even among the two best friends, you don't talk about things like beyond like few minutes, like one minute, maybe 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm really bummed that my wife died. Stop there. And everything's fine. They just go on and on and on. Nobody wants to hear it. Yeah, in the man's world, nobody wants to hear it. If you want to talk on and on, go to confessions, tell the priest. Go well, talk to your pastor. Don't bother your friends. Yeah, that's what pastors are for. That's what a priest is for. You have a priest to so just go and talk on and on, and he has no choice but to listen to you. You know, but I mean, you know, that's why they take vow, vow of suffering, right? They have to hear all this junk from all these guys who who can't share with any other people, right? I mean, it's a painful profession because you have to hear all this junk from other guys, you know. But you know, that's what priests are there for. They're there to listen to you. Um, yeah, so go to your priest, talk to the priest, you know, um, but don't talk to your friends. Yeah, that's like, we don't live in a movie. Men do not like to hear other men talk. Certainly men do not want to see other men cry or like become emotional. That's just disgusting, you know, that's just sick. Yeah, so uh, yeah, don't, don't do that. And that's the quickest way to lose friends. You ostracize in the men's world. Uh, yeah, men just, you know, just keep your mouth shut, tough it out, you know, take up karate or taekwondo, you know, I mean, geez, you know, let your energy out in some other ways. Frustration, don't talk, you know. If you wanna talk, get a girlfriend, you know. Uh, I guess girls like to hear, I don't know. I don't know, some girlfriends may wanna hear you talk, I don't know. Find one who wants to hear you talk if you wanna, Huh. Um, yeah, but you know, that's why guys have girlfriends, right? I mean, the guys want to talk. Yeah, I mean, you know, best thing is bottle it, bottle it and stuff and just forget about it. That's the best way for men to survive in the men's world. You know, just like put it in a box somewhere deep in your heart and throw away the keys. It exists somewhere like in the storage bin, but you just, you forgot where you, where that is, you know, and you may stumble across it in the dark without a flashlight when you're cleaning out your storage, but you know, 
You didn't even remember that it was there. Yeah, that's the best way to handle it as, as a man. Yeah, do not believe everything you watch in the movies. Men do not talk about their problems, problems with other men. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you want to survive in the men's world or not survive in the men's world? Uh, number, rule number three, uh, rule number three on how to, uh, to survive in the men's world uh, is, you know, to just be polite to other men, you know, just like, polite meaning like when they say hi, just say hi back. I mean, it's not, it's not that complicated. You know, like, you know how women, when they're mad at each other, they don't even say hello to that, each other. Have you seen that? In the man's world, you know, you, it doesn't really work that way, you know? You may be pissed off, but you're not talking, right? You're not gonna talk about your problems. Uh, you can socially function as long as you say, hey, what's up? And they're like, yeah, what's up? And you may be pissed off at each other, but that's fine. The moment you say, what's up? And he says, what's up? You can function together. That's just man's world, you know? Like just acknowledging his hello with the hello that smooth over things on a functional level. Uh, we're not women, we're men. There are gender differences. Men's world is very simple. Uh, you know, if the guy said, are you okay? And you say, you're okay, then you're okay, you know? You don't need to talk about it. Men don't want to talk about it. Please don't ask us to talk about it. You know, men hate it when women ask us to talk about our feelings. That's like living in hell, you know? That's, I would say over 50% of the men break up with their girlfriend because their women keep asking them to talk about their feelings. Guys hate that. We don't want to talk about our feelings. Just leave us alone. You know, if you want to keep us around as a boyfriend, women have, have to just like give us space and not ask us to talk. I mean, you know, you could talk about your feelings and we could just like pretend like we're listening, but we could shut down. And like a lot of men, you know, they'll tolerate it because it's the girlfriend, you know? If you're the wife, then men have no choice because men are whooped if they're married. Uh, but uh, if you get a ring on a man, then you've conquered him, you know? But most men don't want to be whooped. That's why no, like you, your boyfriend probably doesn't want to marry you because he doesn't want to be a whoop. You know, <laughs> whoop guy. No man wants to get married unless he he's crazy about a woman. You know, I mean, who wants to get married and be whoop? You know, uh, so uh, you, you know, it makes sense. You know, but um, you know, I mean, I would say ninety nine percent of men prefer not to get married, but when they're falling in love, they can't help themselves. You know, that's how you know that you're in love. You can't help yourself. But you know, majority of the men, when they hit like 26, they get married because like they want kids. You know, they're not getting married because of love, right? They're kind of allowing themselves to get whooped because there's something that they want more than their male independence, and that is like children, right? Like son or daughter, you know, or both. Uh, different men have different preferences. Some men like daughters, some men like sons, some men, you know, they want sons and daughters. Um, but that's the reason guys get married. They're like, guys don't suffer the kind of loneliness that women do. Uh, women get married and sometimes you hear women say, I, I, uh, I don't want to be lonely. That's why I'm with him. Men are not like that. Men prefer to be lonely than with a woman that repulses them. Um, that's just how men are, you know, men prefer to be lonely, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so, yeah, it's not like women, you know? Uh, you know, I hear my female friends all the time saying, hey, I, I'm lonely, I want a guy. Uh, no, guys don't think like that. Guys like, yeah, I want to have somebody to screw, you know, to have sex with, but I don't want her to talk. You know, I, I, you know, I prefer her not to talk if possible. You know, uh, that's how guys, that guys don't want to talk to women. I mean, talking to women for over 95% of the men is like hell. They just don't want it. But you know, they do it because they have to, to get sex or whatever, you know. But if they could have sex without talking to women, 90% of men would not talk to their women. It's just, there's no point, right? Men don't talk to men. That's how men are. Only reason men talk to women is not because they want to talk, but because they have to. It's like a chore. Guys hate, you know, guys hate for it. Uh, and guys hate it when women like force them to talk. I hate that. Uh, yeah, there's nothing more, there's nothing worse than like women who keeps telling you to, to share. 
Oh, man, that's just, like, tell you how you feel. I'm like, geez, you know, that's such a woman thing to do. And, you know, there are gender differences. Men just don't like sharing. Most men, you know, I would say 99.9% of men. I mean, there are some, like, deviants, you know, like, male deviants who are not, like, normal men. But, yeah, most men don't want to share. They don't want to talk about it. It's like, you know, maybe if you're a little kid, you like to talk about it with your mommy. But I'm talking about like normal men, you know, over 18, you know, like a normal man. Uh, don't want to talk about it. You know, and most men prefer to be alone uh, than with a woman that, you know, I mean, you know, that he doesn't really, I mean, she has to be sexually desirable, really, to be with. Now, if, if the girl is not sexually desirable, then most men would not want to be with her, you know, I'm just, I mean, you know, yeah, it's, you know, like most men prefer to be called lonely, but men are not lonely because as I said, like men bond easily, right? Men bond over poker games, men bond over sports, they don't have to talk about anything. You know, men bond over drinking. It's easy to have like friendships among men. You can just drop by anywhere and become friends with men around just by drinking together or watching football games together. You know, it's not that hard. Uh, male bonding isn't that hard. I mean, you know, and even after 20 years of friendship, you know, it's just like there isn't that much talking. Um, yeah, you just kind of like, you know, comment about stuff that you experience, but you don't want to talk about your feelings. You know, that's something that men just don't want to do. Um, yeah, so... The easiest way to lose a man before marriage uh, is just forcing guy to talk about stuff, like his perspective, his feelings. Guys hate that. It's like being in school. I mean, you know, who wants to be in school with his girlfriend? And that's why men dump their girlfriends, even beautiful ones. So they're like, hey, yes, I want to have sex with her, but not that much, you know? I mean, since there's a limit to how much you're going to go to have sex with a woman, you know? That's how men think. They're like, she's past that zone where, you know, when you when you do a cost benefit analysis, the benefit of having sex with her uh, is less than the cost of having to share my feelings with her. You know, then I'm gonna dump her. That's how men think. Men are pretty simple. As long as you don't force the man to constantly talk about him, his feelings, there's, you know, you have higher chance that you're not gonna be dumped. You know, if you want to talk about feelings, talk about your feelings with uh, with your your female friends, right? With your female friends, just leave them alone. You know, because men are like, you know, they're simple. If a man chooses to be together with you, that means he wants to be together with you. He may not necessarily love you enough to be married, because you know it's hard to get men to submit to you in marriage. I mean, you know, but so he may not love you enough to be to marry you, but he likes you, so he's with you. As long as you don't nag him to tell you, tell you his feelings, he's fine with you. You know, that's, you know, but he will walk if you like nag him enough and tell him, like, he needs to tell you your, your feelings. Yeah, he'll walk. I mean, you know, but you will not have many men who will not walk if you keep nagging the guy to tell you his feelings. Guys don't want to talk about things, you know. You want to do something, just do it. You know, we'll go along with it. You know, that's how guys are, you know. Um, yeah, don't debate it to death. You know, that's what women do. You know, women talk hours and hours about a decision. Men don't do that, you know? Uh, you know, men talk maybe three minutes about a very serious decision in, in life. And then they, you know, they may think on their own or whatever, but even best friends, they don't talk more than three minutes about a life-changing decision. You know, they don't, I mean, you know, there's a, like a three minute rule. Even the most serious topic, you don't go over the three minute rule if you want to stay best friends with your friends, you know? I mean, men have limits for how much they're willing to listen to your their best friend talk. <clears throat> so, um, and all men know this, you know, all men who, you know, who are in the male's, male world know, know how male world operates, right? Um, yeah, women are different. Women, women like to talk to each other about everything, you know? Men, men don't, you know? That's just the way men are. Uh, yeah, so if you want to try to elicit a conversation from a man, you're going to fail. Because men will just walk away. Okay? Men avoid difficult conversations. 
men avoid situations where they have to talk about their feelings. They they don't they don't want to they don't want to do that. Just that's like all like 99.9 percent of men. Yeah. So don't think men are like women. Women like to talk about each other's feelings. Men don't. Um. Yeah, and you know this show is helpful, right? Because you know you uh, you may not all know how men think, because you may be uh, a single single mom daughter, right? If you're a daughter of a single mom, you only have a mom who's a woman and you. You're not going to get a man's perspective, and your mom's like probably like bitter about men because she's a single woman. So you're only going to get a perspective of a bitter woman who hates all men. You know, I mean, geez. And you probably have screwed up because of that kind of a perspective that you you uh, you are constantly exposed to. Uh, you're in your immediate social circle, right? So you probably have a lopsided view on what men's world is. So this show is very helpful because I give you the reality of men's world that no man care about you enough to share with you. Even the boyfriends you had, they don't love you enough to like be honest with you, right? Uh, only only men who are genuinely honest with women are like father and brother because they don't want you to get hurt. They're trying to protect you, so they'll tell you the truth. Your male friends are going to lie to you. Your boyfriends are going to lie to you because men lie to women. That's like the fourth unspoken rule. Always lie to the women. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's like rule number four. Is always lie to the women. You know, in relationships, you know, except for. You know, like you would like your mom and your sister, but um, yeah, every other woman, because you know, your mom and your sister are not really women, you know, they're like your family. <clears throat> but every other woman is going to lie to you uh, because that's the rule number four in men. Always lie to the women that you're in relationships with. Never tell them the truth. Every man knows this rule. I mean, it's a, it's a rule that everybody knows around the world if you're a male. It's like in your DNA. Never tell the woman, the truth. Like, you know, if you if a woman wears a dress and you says, well, you know, I, I, I kind of think that's a little too, you know, a little too revealing. You know what's going to happen? Jeez, if you're a guy you, and if you try it, you know what, what's going to happen. You know, or if you say, oh, I think that's not revealing enough. I mean, you, you say what you, you know, like, the moment you share your honest opinion, I mean, geez, you're like done for. And all guys understand this, and many by experience. They've tried it, they try to tell you the truth, and then they got shut down over like five hour period. <laughs> you know, went through weeks of hardship. <laughs> you know, they learned the hard way, like, hey, I lied to the woman. You know, that's the best way, best way to go. So that's how, you know, that's a relationship advice from Kira uh, Christian Kim. I mean, I don't think you should lie to the women, but relationship advice for women. I'm giving this relationship advice for women who want to keep their men. Just don't nag. Make sure you get the finger, the ring on the finger, because until you have a ring on your finger, he can walk at any second. That's the point, right? He's not married to you because he wants to be able to walk away from you. And men feel zero guilt when they walk away from women. Zero guilt. Um, they may feel guilt for like few seconds, you know. I'm talking about men who had relationship with women for like five years, had sex with them for every day for five years, and the women like were 24, 22 to 27. Now she's like fat and ugly, you know, like she's 20 pounds overweight and ugly. I mean, she's uglier. I don't feel bad about having wasted five years of her life. He'll be like, well, I got a good use out of her, you know. I'm talking about good guys. I'm not talking about bad guys here. I'm talking about like a an average good guy that you consider as a nice guy, like any woman who considers a nice guy, what he'll be thinking in his brain, although he'll never say it because he's not stupid. Because remember, rule number four is always lie to the women. Um, guy will be like, well, I got a good use out of her. You know, I got five years of free sex. You know, hey, I'm, I'm ahead in life, you know? You know, I, you know, I, you know, was, you know, I had five years of good sex with a beautiful woman in the height of her beauty. Now I can marry another woman who's, you know, going to enter that stage, you know, at 22, 23. You know, that's how guys think. Yeah, guys are this way, you know. In the guys' world, that's a complete ethical thing to do. You know, uh, most guys go in planning this. They say, well, you know, I'll screw around with her for three, four years. And I'll find a better woman, you know, when I get my JD or MD or PhD. 
you know, she's like my school woman. And then I'll have my wife after her, you know? She's like a stepping stone. You know, I'll practice everything I need to practice, correct all the problems I need to fix. Yes, I sleep with her, I live with her, you know, I use her for three years and then I'll bump her, you know, and whatever happens to her life, that's, you know, she decided to live with me. I didn't force her to live with me. Um, so, you know, I'm just gonna get what I get out of it. And then uh, I'll dump her when she's like old and ugly, like at 27. Because, you know, girls who are 27 are kind of fat, fatter, their thighs are fatter. You have like cottage cheese, you know? You know, I mean, a woman at 18, compared the same woman at 18 and 27, a completely different woman. Like, you know, uh, yeah, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a woman at 27 who's as attractive uh, as when she was 18. It's, it's just, you're, not just gonna, you're not gonna find her. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to help you women out there, you know, because I know a lot of you are like single mom's child because there's like 50% of America gets divorced so you don't get the whole truth. And I, you know, I care about you guys. You know, I don't want you guys to be unhappy in life. I want you to be happy in life. Uh, and there's no reason why you should throw away your life. I mean, if you go to, if you like a guy, if you love a guy, make sure you get him to marry you. Um, because, you know, once he marries you, he knows his work. So you, you have it. He's yours. You know what I mean? You know? But until you, you have, a, you have, a, you put a ring on his finger, or he puts a ring on your finger, you know, you don't, he can walk at any second. He's, he's not going to think, he's still not going to look back at all. That's how guys are. Guys don't care. You know? You know, guys, why do you, why do you think women's the guys are jerks? Because guys are. They don't care. They're selfish. They're jerks, you know. Uh, they could have sex with you for five years, live with you for five years, walk away, think, not think twice about it. They, they will not feel guilty at all. I mean, they may feel guilty literally when they see you and like you're like 30 and not married and you're like fat. They're even like, man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Well, second, though, you know, I got good five years of sex with her, you know. I got something out of it. So she gave something to the world. You know, she gave something to me, so she gave the world some some benefit. You know, that's how guys reason, right? Because guys are kind of self-centered. So, um, you know, <laughs> you know, they, they uh, in, in psychology they call it, call it rationalization. They've used you as a like a personal private whore for five years and threw you away, and they know that's a, that's what they've de done. But they need to be able to live with themselves. They don't, and they want to think that they're a good guy, so they'll rationalize it by saying. Well, I didn't force her to have sex with me. I didn't force her to live with me. Right? I didn't force her to like have sex and live with me from 22 to 27 for free. I, I, you know, she paid 50% of the rent while giving me free sex. You know, I mean, it's not my fault she didn't charge me, you know? But that's how guys are, you know? The guys guys will be like, you know, these guys do pay for sex, right? Like they don't, they don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, right? You're getting something. You pay something in return, you know, guys don't, guys think of that as a fair trade, right? So, you know, um, so they're like, well, if you want to give me sex for free, like we're bargaining, right? It's a transaction, business transaction, type of a contractual transaction. You give me sex, you want something in return, I'll give it to you, you know, fair value. But if you want to give me sex for five years for free and pay 50% of the rent, 50% of the utilities, 50% of the furniture, hey, you know, you know, if you want to be bomb, you know, that's fine, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's how guys think, yeah, um, yeah, you know, I mean, guys don't think like women, you know, guys do not think about marriage or long-term life with a woman they're living with, you know, because if they did, they would marry you, you see what I'm saying, the fact that they haven't married you yet means they don't think that you're good enough for a lifetime of commitment. <laughs> so if you've been living with a guy for like two years and he hasn't even asked you to marry him and both of you are working, obviously he doesn't love you. I mean, he just wants free sex. I mean, you know, and when somebody better comes along, he'll dump you like, a, you know, yesterday's garbage. I can count on it. You know, he's still, you know, he hasn't met somebody better than you yet. But the moment he does, and if she says yes, you're gone. Yeah, that's just uh, you know, male world is that way. Uh, there's just, just too many lies in the world. Uh, you need to know the truth because 
unless you know the truth, you're not gonna be able to find happiness in your life. That's why this show is important. I believe that every woman over 18 should watch this show every day because especially if you don't have a father like living at home, like if you have a single mother, because you're not gonna get the truth. You need the truth to be happy. And you know, you don't wanna be somebody's personal whore for two, three years and get dumped. Uh, and then you're fat and ugly, nobody wants to marry you. Because a woman after 27, generally, and it's, you know, you pass your prime at 27. Most men, I would say 80% of the men would not think of you as his, his first choice if you pass 27. You know, that's just the way men are. Um, yeah, age matters for men. You know, like men like to, to marry women younger. Um, yeah, that's why, you know, my, my age group for marriage is like 18 to 26. That's like my idea, you know, and I'm, I'm being honest with you. I don't feel like I should lie to you about this. Um, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe that people should be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and that's how all men think. Like 99% of the men, if they could marry women, 22 to 24, they will. You know, doesn't matter if they're a pastor. It doesn't matter if they're an elder. It doesn't matter if they're evangelical preachers. doesn't matter if they're like, it doesn't matter who they are, you know, men are men. Um, you know, it's not like Christian men want to marry fat and ugly women, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, um, uh, yeah, men, the most important thing for men is physical beauty. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, non-Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, is Muslim, all men agree on this point. Um, sooner you know the truth, truth will set you free. Because you're assuming a lot of things. You know, you Christian women out there, you think like Christian men don't care if you're fat and ugly. They do. Um, yeah, so make sure you go on a diet after watching this. Because uh, being thin is half the battle, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, don't blame Jesus if you're fat and ugly, right? Blame yourself because you could have eaten less. You could have exercised more, right? Um and then you'd be happily married because you're pretty. And if you worked hard to get married between you know 18 to 24, but you were too lazy and you waited until 27, and don't be complaining to God, you brought this upon yourself. So if you see why this show is important, because if if you didn't watch this show, you're hearing all these lies from your mother, you're hearing all these lies from your like male friends, uh, you know, and your female friends don't have a clue. Um, and like you're 30 years old and you don't know what happened to your life, you're never going to be happy in the romance department until you die. Um, as Kamala Harris, you know, I'm sure she understands what I'm saying. I'm sure Kamala Harris is like, man, I wish I heard you out and Kim when I was 18 to 24. I would have met that guy I liked, you know, in, in uh, if you go to law school, like law school, married him and had like two, three children and then continued on my career. You don't think... Camilla Harris could have achieved become a U.S. Senator with, you know, three or four children or, or become a Supreme Court Justice nominee? Of course she could have. It's just that nobody told her the truth. Because she, she was, she's a child of divorce, you know, Camilla Harris. So, like, she didn't have a man in her life to tell her the truth, right? That's, that's the bad thing about being a child of a single mom, because you only hear the woman, angry woman's perspective, the angry woman. You know, woman who hates men because men left her, you know, perspective. You're scarred for life just by listening to her talk about how angry she's at men. Um, you know, that's like traumatizing for little girls to hear their single mother, like, you know, like say all these negative things about men all the time. I mean, it's, it's traumatic. Um, so yeah, I mean, it makes sense that Camilla Harris's woman's life was completely messed up. And she just recently got married a few years ago, right? To a guy, and um, you, know, um, you know, I don't know if they're happily married or not, but uh, she could have been happily married much younger. Like, you know, she's pretty, she's attractive. Uh, you know, I'm sure she was, she, she might have been really pretty when she was 20. I don't know, I haven't seen a photo of her 20, but she probably, you know, she might have been able to pick from all the men who wanted her, you know, she should have. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you could turn out to be like Kamala Harris with 30 years of desert in the women's department. I mean, you know, and Camilla Harris, you know, she may be happy, she may not. I mean, I don't know what her situation is in her marriage, but 
you know, majority of the people, you know, who very late there, it's more like a social transaction. It's not really a woman take love marriage, you know. I'm not saying that's not Camilla Harris's situation. I mean, it, it may be, but it may not be. I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, uh, people who marry late, you know, it's a little bit different than people who marry um, young, you know. Um, there are more baggages, there are more conditions, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of social structures, you know. Um, yeah. Whereas when you get married at age 18 or 20, it's, you know, it's, most of it is love. You know, it's not about anybody else. It's about you and the guy, you know? And there's, it's not about social structures, titles, you know? These things don't matter, you know, when you're 18, that much, you know? I mean, it may matter a little bit, but, you know, um, yeah. But anyway, um, 1,048 people have died in the last 24 hours. Uh, and since today is... Uh, uh, chocolate cupcake day. Uh, I wanted to share photos of you uh, from Kappa Delta Pi annual convocation. Kappa Delta Pi is International Honor Society in education, so like all the teachers. Um, because you know, teachers bake chocolate cupcake for their students as an external motivator uh, for the students to do their homework, you know, as a reward system. Because, you know, children will do stuff that they normally not do if you give them, like, cupcakes, you know? So uh, teachers often learn to bake or spend their hard-earned money on cupcakes to entice their children or students to study. You know, that's well, every single teacher knows what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, I went to a Kappa Delta Pi conference and shared the paper. Uh, this was in Norfolk, Virginia in uh, October of 2019 when I presented my paper to... Uh, National Convocation 2020 um, well, had been scheduled for uh, Kentucky, but it was canceled because of COVID. But last year, one year ago, it was in um, um, you know, Norfolk, Virginia. I would love to have gone to a National Com Convo in Kentucky and see like all the beautiful people I met and defended. Um, because conferences is where you casually meet everyone again, you know? Um, like when I gave a paper, you, know, there, you see on the left side by the cross, two uh, PhD students uh, presented their paper on uh, education and their PhD students at uh, Texas A&M University. And they're actually like teaching there. So they teach like bachelors of education students who are studying to be uh, teachers uh, while working on their PhD. Like some of my teachers at Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies, um, they're doing their PhD in nursing right now, you know, uh, so like Professor Elizabeth Schloss, uh, she's doing her PhD, uh, in nursing at, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University right now, and she's our professor. So she's like a full professor teaching us full time, but she's also doing her PhD in nursing at Virginia Commonwealth University. So she drives down to Richmond, Virginia for her PhD in nursing, and then she drives back, like whenever there are seminars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, like a lot of professors are working on their PhDs, you know, uh, so, um, so there are, you know, there are two, two people who are like that, uh, and they're going to be really nice. Um, next to that is, um, Maddie, Maddie, uh, she's Jewish, ethnically, her father and mother, uh, they didn't, they're still Jewish, they're not, they didn't convert to Christianity, but for some reason, you know, Maddie converted to Christianity, and I like to hear the whole story sometime, you know. But I met her, she's a, a Bachelor of Education major at Liberty University. Uh, she's a second year, so she's uh, she's third year this year, uh, junior. Uh, hi, Maddie. Uh, um, but yeah, so she, I think she's from, uh, she's from Virginia. Uh, and she was telling me like she and her father and mother, no, or is she from Pennsylvania? Like she, uh, she likes to go to DC with her mom and father. So, you know, we talked about meeting up at some time, you know, I have her, I have her phone number, so maybe I should, Give her a call and see. But I mean, there's COVID-19. So, I mean, you know, I mean, what are the chances that she's going to go see DC during COVID-19? I mean, I don't know, maybe. Uh, and then the next tour is another uh, bachelor student in education. Uh, and she's, um, so I think she's from uh, Kentucky uh, or maybe uh, Tennessee. But she's like, uh, I think she's second year as well, sophomore. So she's probably like 19 years old. Like Maddie, I think is 19. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she's really nice. So, like, you know, I had, I had like lunch with Maddie that day. And then I, I think that was like a dinner. 
Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, and then uh, Ashley, uh, Ashley's uh, from Fairfax County. She goes to Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, she's in her blue, blue dress. And she's a third year, uh, I think this year is her third year in Bachelor of Education at Virginia Commonwealth University. She presented a poster research. And it was really interesting. She uh, She's like focusing on, uh, um, I think she's focusing on a math. Yeah, she's focusing on math because I invited her to come to the Virginia uh, uh, Council of Teachers of Mathematics, BCTM conference. Um, and the next to that is, uh, 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 you know, uh, beautiful Caitlin uh, from West Georgia. She graduated, not West Georgia, what I'm saying. I, I graduated from the University of West Georgia with Master of Education in uh, reading, you know, uh, reading instruction. Uh, so I'm a reading specialist. But uh, Maddie actually did her bachelor's of education at a university in West Georgia, uh, West, uh, West Virginia, not West Georgia, West Virginia. Uh, and Caitlin, she's pretty, so she said, so I'm trying to get her to come to Arlington Public Schools or Fairfax Public Schools or Alexandria City Public Schools or Fair, you know, Foster City Public Schools or DC Public Schools in this area. But she just graduated in, uh, uh, you know, uh, May 2020. Um, I should probably call her up and like, catch up on stuff, you know? I have so many people, friends to call and catch up on what's been happening, you know? It's uh, life at the school fast. And she's in like West Virginia. I guess she's in West Virginia. I don't know. I don't know where she. Can, I, I should give her a call so I can catch up. You know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah. And then uh, above that, you know, you'll see uh, photos of um, you know uh, photos of uh, poster conference uh, or or next to it is poster conference. Uh, delivery uh, from Florida Bachelor of Education students and how you know the coordinated red and black outfit. It's really cute, I thought. Really, really nice. Um, so I thought you know we'll cover like top five um, uh, cases in USA. And the big news uh, is um, that um, Georgia dropped out of number five. So Georgia is no longer in the top five. Illinois beat Georgia, uh, beat out Georgia, and now Illinois is number five. So number one for COVID-19 cases is California, um, 875,275 cases, a 2% death rate, because the majority of the death were in the summer, that's why. And, and in the summer, death rate is lower. Uh, in the winter, death rate is higher. So 16,979 people died so far in California. Texas has 850,282 cases, a 2% death rate, 17,464 people have died so far. Number three, Florida is 755,020. Uh, death rate is at 2%. 15,967 have uh, died um, so far. New York is 484,281 uh, and 7% uh, death rate because most of the New Yorkers died in the winter. So you can see the number of deaths is much higher, 33,357 because death rate is higher. So higher death rate is coming to all 50 states in the winter. So don't, you know, don't get disappointed right now that your death rate is only 2% because it's going to be like 10%, 20% during the height of winter and we have like six more months to go. So no need to worry. You're going to experience what New York experienced every one of the 50 states, uh, all the major cities. Um, Illinois is number five. Uh, and so they have 347,631 cases and death rate is 3% uh, at 9,474. Uh, but Illinois, you know, as you can see, they're beginning to have a lot of cases so that a lot of deaths are coming in the winter in Illinois. Um, so 1,048 people have died so far in the last 24 hours. Um, so you have a total death of 219,666 in the United States of America. And confirmed cases is 8,147,000. 
587. There's a high chance a lot of people are going to die. I'm predicting at least 3 million will die in America, but more like 30 million will die by next June 2021. There's no vaccine. There's no cure. Any kind of vaccine that's rushed is probably going to do more harm than good. Um, and all the experts say uh, COVID-19 doesn't provide full immunity. So any vaccine you take, even if it works, it's not going to protect you for the whole season, the whole 365 days a year. Uh, because it's not a seasonal virus, it's a 365 days a year virus. So even if they develop a vaccine that works, uh, you know, you're out of luck. Uh, because it's, yeah, I mean, COVID-19 is mutating and it's not like the flu, you know? So, um, yeah, so you're out of luck. But, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm predicting that in the next few decades, if uh, COVID-19 continues, more than 2 billion people in the world can die from COVID if it sustains itself and continues to be lethal, uh, which is possible. Um, so we'll let you know, let's see, you know, uh, we can talk more 10 years from now, you know, uh, see how many people died so far. Maybe we'll have 2 billion people died within 10 years, less than 10 years. Well, let's see, you know, um, because there's an exponential growth. So uh, these are all scientifically possible realities. So, you know, if you're like 18 year old, find a nice guy, get married, you can do like bachelor's online or, you know, I mean, you know, you should hold off marriage because you know, you pass 22, you know, your beauty starts going down. You know that? I mean, women like to pretend like they, they want to be beautiful forever. It's not true. Um, yeah, you lose, start losing your beauty at like 22. I would say 18 to 22, you pass 22, most women start fading. Like they, their glow starts fading at age 22. I'm an expert on women. I've dated a lot of beautiful women. So, I mean, I'm expert by the virtue of that, the fact that I've dated. A lot of different beautiful women. Um, yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah, let's go to the next. Um, uh, yeah, so basically, um, hmm. so for today, you know, I thought I would, um, um, Focus on this this question: Is COVID nineteen mutating to kill more people in USA in six months of flu season? Because you're probably wondering about that, right? What's going to happen in the next six months? Uh, I believe that Joe Biden will die of COVID nineteen in the next six months, even if he be, gets elected to president. I believe he's going to die. You know, he may die any time from now to like next May. That's what I I believe. I you know maybe I'm wrong, but let's see. You know, I don't think I'm going to be wrong. Because there's going to be exponentially growing death. President Trump could die as well. Um, it's possible. A six months of flu season uh, can be horrific. So let's see what happens. But if I were on a betting man, I would bet that Joe Biden will die before June 2021. Whether he becomes president or not, it's irrelevant, right? Well, it's not like you know you become president, you're not going to die from COVID-19. You know what I mean? Uh, you don't have immunity just because you're president. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, so the first article uh, is the coronavirus is mutating. Does it matter? It was in Nature on September 16, 2020. Uh, it was written by Ewan uh, Calloway. And the significant quote there uh, is, do you like the, the Irish music in the background? Nice, right? Celtic music from Ireland. Uh, the reason I have that is because Illinois entered number five. They're like now number five, and lot, there are a lot of uh, Irish Catholics in Chicago. They call Chicago like an Irish Catholic city. You have the Loyola University of Chicago. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll play something Irish, you know, uh, Celtic music from Ireland, you know, just to put you in the mood as we uh, think about Illinois being number five now uh, in terms of COVID 19 cases in America. You know, you gotta celebrate the good. You know, it's not like, you know, when 3 million Americans are dying from now to uh, May, you can't just focus on the bad, right? You can also focus on the good. Because, you know, it's a cycle of life. People are born, people live, people die, you know? Yes, 3 million people can die, but, you know, their babies being born, you know, people getting married, smart women making sure that the men in their life marries them, you know, 
there are dumb women and pretty, uh, there are dumb women and smart women, right? And smart women are the ones who have rings in their fingers. Um, well, that's the way men think anyway, you know? Um, yeah, so the quote is this. The researchers didn't test whether any of the mutations allow the virus to thwart the action of antibodies, but his team's results suggest that such changes are possible. So mutations of COVID-19 can thwart, meaning stop or evade antibody protection. So even if you have antibody, meaning you had COVID-19 before, like President Trump, COVID-19 can mutate and they could get COVID-19 again. And the antibodies you already have from COVID-19 you got before will not be able to stop that. The second second uh, wave of illness that could kill you, or even third wave, fourth wave. Uh, it, it is a possibility but by no means a certainty. So, so all the scientists are saying that it's possible, but it's not certain. But that was September. Now in October 28, 16, most people are saying that it's probable. It's not just a possibility, but it's a probability. That's where uh, scientists are. Uh, it is a possibility, but by no means a certainty that the virus will acquire mutations that change its susceptibility to antibodies and immunity, says Bloom. Based on experience from other coronaviruses that might take years. But you know, COVID-19 isn't like other coronaviruses. Uh, studies of common cold coronaviruses, simple, there's no vaccine for common cold. Yeah, so for you to think that there's gonna be vaccine for COVID, yeah, even from the concept of cold, it's, uh, it's a fantasy that you're going to have a vaccine because there's no vaccine for common cold. Uh, studies of common cold coronavirus sampled across multiple seasons have identified some signs of evolution in response to immunity. But the pace of change is slow, says Forker Field, an RNA virologist at the Institute of Virology and Immunology in Bern, that's in Switzerland. Uh, these strains remain constant, more or less with most of the world still susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is like COVID-19, it is unlikely that immunity is currently a major factor in the virus's evolution, meaning so many people have not gotten COVID yet. COVID may not feel like it needs to mutate to infect you. That's what he's saying. Because you know, uh, COVID is a, mutating virus so if it infected enough people it can mutate to infect more people right that's that's what he's saying uh with most of the world still susceptible to sars covid 2 it's unlikely that immunity is currently a major factor in viruses evolution because virus evolves to survive right but as population wide immunity rises right whether through infection or vaccination, vaccination, that's the key word you can look at, a steady trickle of immune evading mutations could help SARS to, to establish itself permanently, says Shia. Meaning vaccine, ironically, vaccine may be the reason why COVID-19 becomes permanent in the world for decades and decades. That's what it's saying. Because of vaccine, COVID-19 may become permanent. So that's what some scientists are saying. If you vaccinate everyone, the possible end result is that you can never get rid of COVID-19 forever. And then it can evolve in a way to evade the antibodies and the vaccines. So not only will you have COVID-19 forever because of the vaccines that are Develop. COVID-19 may be immune, may not be affected by any vaccine because they learn to evade it, survive through it. It's like super, uh, super infection, like, you know, um, vancomycin resistant, you know, um, VR enterococcus, I guess, like uh, VRE, uh, or uh, saw, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, 
you know, there are all these super viruses that evade anti antibiotics. And the reason that they developed is because hospitals gave antibiotics to patients who were sick. And the virus or bacteria developed immunity to the anti well, I guess it's bacteria because antibiotics is for bacteria. Bacteria develops immunity to the antibiotic. And then you have a super bacteria that is harder to kill and kills more people. Yeah, like through sepsis. And so um, sepsis is like infection that could destroy your organs. So don't think that people rushing to create a vaccine is a good thing. It may be the vaccines that are quickly administered that makes COVID-19 permanent in the world, meaning like you'll be here with you for 50 years. You have to wear a mask for the next 50 years. Um, so vaccines may be what will make COVID-19 absolutely permanent and that you will never get rid of it because of the vaccines that are being developed. So that's what scientists are saying. Uh, so uh, that's the irony of vaccines, right? People are touting vaccines as the hero or the savior, but ironically, it may be the vaccines that may help COVID-19 live forever and kill forever. That's what the scientists are saying. So do you really want vaccine companies to rush vaccines? I mean, you know, you know, you know what they say, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Have you heard that saying before? What does not kill you will make you stronger. Have you heard that saying? Can I get a five or what does not kill you will make you stronger? Well, that may be good in your personal life, but how about for coronavirus? If vaccine is half-baked and it doesn't kill the coronavirus, it just put a dent in it. Now the coronavirus has had a taste of the vaccine and it develops immunity to that vaccine and every other vaccine that could develop using that vaccine technology because it can get killed off. So now it's completely immune to any future vaccines using the current vaccine technology because COVID-19 now has developed immunity to that format of vaccine and then you're going to have 500 million people die in the flu season one year from now now they're completely immune and they are more virulent because of the half baked vaccine so that's why we're looking at Do you see why i oppose any kind of vaccine that's rushed because we're talking about a living organism here we're not talking about like robots that you destroy with rockets we're talking about constantly mutating, constantly evolving living organism that is a predator and we are the prey, right? Anything we throw at COVID-19 shows our secret weapon, right? We may have technology that could 10 years from now kill COVID, but we have not fully perfected it and we're releasing it all over the the country, right? New York Governor Cuomo says he has a plan to distribute it widely in New York. Virginia Governor Northam says he has a plan to distribute it widely in Virginia. So COVID-19 everywhere now will have a blueprint for what we are trying to use to kill them. And all they need is a blueprint to evolve around it to survive forever. Because the technology that we have is the technology we have. We're not going to get any new technology. So we may only get one shot at this. And you want to squander it off? Do you want to use the secret weapon when it's not perfect? Because what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. You can't use it again. It's a one-shot deal. You mess it up this time, COVID-19 knows the strategy you're using to try to kill it off. And it's going to make that impossible. It's going to evolve to make that impossible to do. It's like cockroaches. Have you had cockroaches at your own? You use one kind of cockroach killer and you kill it. 
what happens? Eventually, they develop immunity. You can't kill it off with the same cockroach kill. You're gonna get something stronger. Have you had that experience before? I grew up in Philadelphia in a very poor neighborhood um, in the inner city, in, in the hood. There were a lot of cockroaches, so I know exactly what that is, you know? Cockroaches, you know, they said a nuclear bomb cannot kill off cock cockroaches. That's how they are. Now, you're talking about a coronavirus, which is probably much more powerful than the cockroaches, because you don't see cockroaches killing us off like COVID-19, COVID you want to introduce a half-baked weapon against our predators, thereby making it impossible for us to ever use our current most advanced vaccine technology to destroy COVID ever again, we will not have a new technology. This is it. Because every technology we're going to have in the future will be based on the technology we have now. So we're going to use this technology widely, allowing COVID-19 to understand our strategy, our blueprint, our method of trying to kill it off so that it, it evolves in a way that, that protects that weakness that they didn't know that they have, that we're trying to exploit through our vaccine. You see what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, don't think that 2 billion Americans, the 2 billion people in the world cannot die in the next three years. It may be because of the vaccine. It's like super bacteria, right? Super bacteria that was created. Uh, and that kills off 100,000 people per year. Super bacteria. Um, yeah. Second article, a rare COVID-19 complication was reported in children. Now it's showing up in adults. You see how crazy it is? First, COVID-19 mutated so that they could infect the babies, children. And that was like in month of April, May in New York. And what Hira Christian came dubbed as the New York virus. So it's been infecting and also killing children in the summer months. And now it has mutated from the mutation to infect adults. So it's made a full circle. It came from the adults to infect the children. But now it's seeing that it's effective in killing children through different means. So now it's now it's mutated to infect adults as well. Uh, the mutated version. That's why you're not gonna get rid of this COVID-19. It's very complicated. It's been less than a year and you see the same strain mutating two, three times, coming full circle around to mutate adults again. Yeah, we're looking at a highly intelligent next generation biological weapon. Um, maybe China didn't even anticipate it. Maybe now it's even outside of China's control because you know once mutations happen, you know maybe they don't have the antidote anymore. Whatever antidote they had for the original one. Uh, if it's a biological weapon, and I hear a Christian came and claiming it is a biological weapon created by China in the lab, but like all living organisms, they mutate, and the original antidote may not work anymore. And that's my theory. Um, Yeah, a rare COVID-19 complication was reported in children now it's showing up in adults. That's Erica Edwards, NBC News, uh, October 16, 2020. So it's uh, one month after the article that we, had, we read earlier. MISA stands for Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome in Adults. When the condition was identified in children this spring, like in April, May in New York, it was named MIS-C, with the C standing for children. Kids were developing dangerous inflammation around the heart and other organs, often weeks after their initial infection with SARS, COVID-2, COVID the virus that caused COVID-19. So they got COVID, weeks later, they're getting this inflammation in their organs. And so, President Trump and his wife could die from this inflammation that could strike them like a month later. We don't know. 
we have to wait because President Trump just got COVID. We don't know if he's got the strain that's going to start inflaming all his organs one month later or two months later and then kill them all. We don't know. Um, as of October 1st, the CDC had reported 1,027 confirmed cases of MIC uh, with more cases under investigation. 20 children have died so far from MIC. But this flu season, we could have thousands of children dying from MIC, which is a mutated version of uh, COVID-19. It's not all COVID does this. Um, you could be infected with different strains, obviously. Scientists just do not know how the different strains work with each other. Uh, there's just so much research that needs to be done. We need at least two, two decades to, to, to come up with a credible, understandable theory with evidence. <clears throat> yeah. What that all boils down to is this. 3 million to 30 million Americans will die this flu season. That's to be expected. You should be shocked if less than 3 million die because that's like a miracle. Um, and here at Christian Kim, as you know, I'm independent candidate for US Congress in Virginia's 8th district. I'm predicting that 100 million would die in the world by June 2021. So uh, about eight months from now, we'll have 100 million people in the world dead. Yeah. No vaccine's gonna work, no cure's gonna work. If you vaccinate people with whatever vaccine you think you have, you may make this permanent for the next 50 years. So take that risk if you want. I advise against it. Uh, but take that risk of speeding up its permanent nature, right? If you're going to strike the virus at a large scale level, don't you want to use what's going to effectively kill it? Have you seen the movie Armageddon? They had one shot killing that asteroid before it hit the Earth, right? Do you remember Independence? Or was it not Independence Day? Um, yeah, you know that. What was that movie title from? Uh, with Bruce, Bruce Willis uh, and the son of um, Aerosmith guy. And that son, daughter of Aerosmith guy. What's her name? Um, yeah, so Armageddon, right? Armageddon. So Armageddon, uh, name is after the Bible version of Armageddon. In the movie Armageddon, um, Ben Affleck was there as a protagonist and Bruce Willis as, um, I guess he's the father of the daughter, the actress, uh, uh, who's the daughter of uh, Aerosmith, um, singer, lead singer. Uh, and um, there's an asteroid that's coming to hit America or the world. Earth is about to be destroyed by this asteroid. So they're, they're seeing if they can fire a nuclear missile to destroy it. And they're seeing that they can't really do that. They have to do it like by going physically on the asteroid and drilling and putting the nuclear bomb inside the asteroid core. Uh, because their argument is if you hit asteroid from outside through a missile, it may not destroy it. But if you drill and put nuclear bomb inside its core, then it will destroy the whole uh, asteroid. Um, and they, their argument is, hey, I get one shot out of this. If they miss, everybody in the world's gonna die. You should think of this COVID-19 vaccine experiment in that way. It's not like you use a, a, a vaccine this time for like hundreds of millions of people in America and it fails, they could do it again. It's one shot. You either do it now, you either do it April 2021 or you do it like Christmas 2021, you better have one that works. Because if you don't have one that works, you have infected, you have injected over 200 million people with this COVID-19 vaccine, so-called vaccine, 
that may make COVID-19 immortal. It will be forever. It's like super viruses, the super bacteria, they're forever. Super bacteria is forever. You're not going to get rid of them. It's here forever on them. It was created because of the antibiotics. Obviously, you know, it, can't, it couldn't be helped. You know, we had to use the antibiotics to kill the bacteria. But it just comes to show you the diversity and versatility of bacteria, killer bacteria. They're versatile. We're not joking around here with toys here. You know, you're talking about cosmic war. We are the prey. COVID-19 is the predator. I know that at least five people from my cohort, CNL 2020, will most likely die by Christmas 2020, unfortunately. Because you know, a lot of people are gonna die. I'm predicting that 10,000 nurses will die. Minimum 12 nurses in each hospital in this area will die. So 12 nurses from Virginia Hospital Center, 12 nurses from Innova Fairfax Hospital, 12 nurses from Innova Alexandria Hospital, 12 nurses from National Ch Children's National Hospital, 12 nurses from George Washington Hospital, 12 nurses from Metzler Georgetown Hospital, 12 nurses from Washington Hospital Center, 12 nurses from Sibley Hospital, they will die. Minimum before Christmas. Watch. This is a killer virus. It's not a joke. Scientists have been studying pandemics for hundreds of years. And this is science. We're not talking about a joke here. We're talking about science. And you make it sound like you're going to live. You're going to outlive this virus. What? What, are you living in a fictional world? You have to live in reality with facts and figures and science. Numbers don't lie. We have 1,000 people dying every day. There is absolutely no proof that this is going to go away. There's no evidence it's going to go away. And as you can see from scientific research, the vaccine may make COVID-19 permanent for 50 years, 100 years into the future. So you think things are gonna get better for you, right? Fake news, I do not believe in fake news, the liberal media, because there are truth, facts, and figures. Truth is the truth. So don't be surprised if your child dies of COVID-19 in the next six months. Because millions are going to die in America alone. Millions are going to die in Latin America, in Brazil, Mexico, Bolivia, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, Venezuela. Millions are going to die in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Italy, France. The Pope himself may die. There's going to be only death destruction and darkness for next six months. Because that is the will of God. Because everything that happens in the world happens because of the will of God. This is God's will. So choose wisely. As I said, if you vote for me to be your congressman in Virginia's 8th District, our Linton, Alexandria Falls Church in Fairfax County. I'll go to U.S. Congress, clean up the mess, and focus on your life. As you know, I worked three months to close down Fairfax County Public Schools, Alexandria City Public Schools, Falls Church City Public Schools, Arlington County Public Schools. Three months I've worked hard every day to close these down so I could save your children from COVID-19 death. And you could get COVID from your children and die too, to save you from COVID-19 death. So you know you have proof that I will work to save your life, your children's life. 
Vampire did nothing to save your life. Vampire is the current U.S. congressman. He's a Democrat. That's why you should vote for me. Because you know I work hard to save your children's life. Your life. You do what you want, obviously. If you vote for me to be your U.S. congressman and I win, I go to Congress work for you. If I do not win, I continue working as a nurse in Virginia Hospital Center. I'll try to save as many neighbors as possible because I live in Arlington. You know, anybody could come to Virginia Hospital Center, but a lot of Arlington residents come there. You know, emergency room, you call 911, you're right there. Um, yeah, you know, so um, you choose, but choose wisely. I hope that you'll be well and that your family will be well too. This is Daily Show, so I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye!